All right, in this video, we're going to break down the actual rates of return of a whole life insurance policy, and I will show you how to uh, read an illustration, what questions to ask for, how to tell if your life insurance policy is, is a good growth, how to truly compare the difference between different insurance companies, and I'm going to um, dispel the myth that life insurance is a terrible place to put your money, but I'm also gonna disagree with the people that say life insurance is the best investment in the world, or it's way out, it will way outperform your investment. So in, in a sense, I'm gonna make nobody happy. I'm not gonna make the life insurance people happy, and I'm not gonna make the, the people that are saying life insurance is a horrible place to put your money, because if you've watched any of my videos, you'll understand that life insurance is not an investment. The biggest mistake people make when they talk about life insurance is they compare it to other investments, and it's not an investment if someone's selling it to you like an investment run because you will be disappointed life insurance should never be sold should never be talked about as an investment um, but when life insurance is set up and used properly it gives you so many benefits gives you future benefits that potentially could outperform investments but more importantly gives you the ability to give create multiple utility or uses for your dollar and as a result it makes it where you want to have some um, uh, some or a majority of the foundational assets in your portfolio should be in life insurance. And my hope is to break that down and show you why I think life insurance is an amazing rate to return, even though I would never compare it to an investment. And my hope is that if you do something like this, you either work with people like us or work with someone that knows what they're doing. If you don't, um, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to be like what I'm showing you. So that's my disclaimer. Um, I think one one thing that is really, really important is always when you're looking at a life insurance policy, people can people can straight up lie to you about the rates of return or a lot of them are just misled. Just ask for the internal rate of return, the internal rate of return, the IRR. The IRR shows you what the internal rate of return is going to be. Now, people could say, well, Caleb, um, we don't know what the next 30 years are going to look like, 100%. But it's looking at it's looking at a projection and saying, take out all the fees, take out all the insurance costs, take out all the commissions. This is the actual rates of return that your policy is going to grow by. This is this is what this is what matters. So if we're comparing different insurance companies, we can look at the IRR way more accurate than looking at dividends because dividends can straight up lie. Dividends can they can, someone could say now this again, I'm not going to die on this statement, but someone could say my dividends 10 percent and your dividend six. What's the internal rate of return? I guarantee you it's not going to be a 4% difference. And so um, this just it's just my experience. Majority of people don't know this. And so when we look at the internal rate of return, and then when you add other factors like taxes, fees, cost of insurance, you're going to realize that life insurance is not an investment, but it's a pretty darn good asset that can grow and give you utility of your dollars. It's an incredible asset in the short term and long term. Um, if you understand the uses of it. And so that's what we're going to break down. And so section 7702 um, is part of the tax code that essentially gives the tax-free nature of life insurance. So when it's set up and used properly, your life insurance can grow tax-free, can be used tax-free, and will can get passed on income tax-free to the next generation. And this is uh, an incredible benefit, especially with, um, you know, taxes potentially being higher in the future. This is a, this is a benefit of why some people want a portion of their money into life insurance. You have Albert Einstein that is um, misquoted, but he's, it's like, it's like Albert Einstein actually didn't say this, but he's misquoted for saying this so much that I think we should just give him credit. Like, I, I think he deserves to say this, this quote. Um, but he, he says, competence is, is the eighth one of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. Obviously we want to understand compounding. So what is compounding? Uh, compounding is a function of three things. You need something to compound. This is the biggest mistake that a lot of people make is they don't have anything to compound. 100% of zero is still zero. So you need something to compound. You need to earn an interest rate to compound. And then you need time. And that's where the hockey stick growth comes in because there gets to a point where now your interest is earning on so much of the interest that have, has earned on your principal that it just becomes this hockey stick growth. Um, this is the mistake that a lot of people make is they kill the goose that's laying the golden egg. And one thing that I love about life insurance, when set up and used properly, your dollar will literally grow for the rest of your life versus to retirement. So, so many people think so short term and, um, life insurance is not a short term asset, but it will literally give you the ability to grow your money and 
you have the ability to use it without hurting the growth. And that's why this asset is such a powerful asset to have at your portfolio. So here's, we're getting into numbers. Okay. So a properly designed policy will show you some kind of cash value early on and will break even in year four, five, six, maybe seven. Okay. And so this policy breaks even in year six. I want to be very clear that this is not, I'm not going on record saying this is the greatest policy design. I'm just showing you you know, how to read an IRR statement. So we put $50,000 into a policy. We have cash value at the end of the year, 39,432 bucks. Okay. Meaning we have a negative IRR of 21%. IRR is just looking on the cash, cash on cash. Okay. It's not looking at any of the other benefits. So it does not looking at the $1.3 million death benefit that you have. It's not looking at the ability that you can borrow against this 39,000 and still get the growth rate. Right? It's not looking at the other living benefits. It's not looking at the future cash flow that you'll have more because of this, this money is in your, your portfolio. It's just looking at the cash growth rate, which can be misleading from a standpoint of like, we can't just look at this. This is, this is not telling you the own, like this is not sharing the only benefit of life insurance, but it's, it's giving you the rate of return benefit. Um, and so if you cashed out your policy in year one, you would have a negative growth rate of 21%. Not, not ideal, not great. Um, I'll be the first to say this is, it's not, not a good deal. Um, in year two, you put in $100,000 total and you have $82,000, $681, meaning if you cashed out in that year, you now have an annualized um, you know, return of negative 12%, okay? You can see the death benefit is increasing and the reason it's increasing is um, you're buying so much paid up additions that it, it essentially needs to increase the death benefit just to make this all tax free. You can see in year five, you're, you have point negative three six percent meaning if you cancel, um, you've almost broke even, but you're still in the red. In year six, now you've crossed over. Now you have more money uh, that you've put in. You, know, you, have, you have more money than what you've put in. So technically, if you cancel this policy, you'd have a nine... $9,000 growth, which is an equivalent of a 0.87%. Now, now I want to show now this 0.87% increases pretty quickly. And this is where a lot of people, including advisors, say, well, okay, this is where you're starting to get arbitrage. Or, you know, in year, in year 10, you're starting to earn 2%. And you're like, okay, that's okay, that's decent, but that's hard to get excited about. Like, in year 30, you're finally, in year 30, you're earning 4.8% five five eight percent where they're they're wrong is the internal rate of return is taking into account all the down years so and on an annual percentage you're actually earning way greater than four point five eight percent because it's including the negative years but this is showing every year um if you if it's showing every single year including the beginning year so to break this down i have a future value calculator and so um, if you put fifty thousand dollars in, and again, fifty thousand is just an example. I'm not. I'm not saying that you you could use this for fit five thousand. It's just the example that I have. So you put fifty thousand dollars in every year, at, and you know over thirty years, if you earn four point five eight percent every single year, you would have three point two million. You know this number, and you can see this is the exact number, meaning that life insurance gets you a four point four point five eight percent rate of return every single year, including the negative year. So, so here, here's the question that I, I usually ask people. Life insurance, when you understand that it's not an investment, when you understand that it's an asset that you have access to that capital while it continues to grow, what other safe liquid assets do you have control over your capital earn you anywhere near 4.5% in today's interest rates? Zero. So when we say life insurance is a terrible rate of return, we're comparing it to an investment, which we should never compare it to. If we compare it to a savings account or a safe asset, it's an amazing asset. It's an amazing rate of return. Plus, at, the, at 30 years, not only is your cash value earning 4.5% tax-free, but you have $5.8 million permanent death benefit that's attached with that. Again, I, I, it's, it's not an investment. This, this capital right here can be utilized and borrowed against to do other things with. That's amazing. That's why I believe if people understood the power of this asset, there would be a line outside the door. Now, here's the other thing that I want to say is um, if we compare this to a savings account, we have to compare taxes. We have to compare fees. We have to compare opportunity costs of potentially buying term insurance. And, and so if you just 
include a 30% income tax and a 1% fee, you take that 4.58% rate of return, and now you need to earn over 7.6% every single year without a down year just to quote unquote keep up with the horrible, boring life insurance growth that life insurance gets you. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that life insurance is an incredible, it's incredible growth if you understand how to compare it to uh, other assets in your portfolio. And so really the question that I've learned from uh, Todd Langford is we need to ask a question compared to what and to everything. This is a bad an asset compared to what? And, and so when we, when we ask this question to, into life insurance, I believe it's an amazing asset when you compare it to other assets. And so here's a little uh, lesson that we'll end with. I, th I think, again, it's really, really important that we understand um, how to compare things. And so if your life insurance gets an internal rate of return of 3.5%, okay? I've seen life insurance with 3%. I've seen life insurance close to 5% internal rate of return. But let's just say 3.5% and we add a tax rate of 30%. Now, some people will say, well, I don't have anywhere near 30% income tax rate. Okay, we can, we can lower it. But I want you to consider what the future could hold, and I also want you to consider that we have a lot of clients in California and other places, and they're like, 30% would be amazing. So I just use 30%. If you just take that internal rate of return at 3.5%, and we compare it to a savings account, number one, majority of savings accounts don't, can't even hold a candle to this long term. But even if they could, now the savings account has to earn 5% just to keep up with a boring old 3.5% because life insurance grows tax-free and your savings account doesn't. I know it's it, we don't really notice it because we earn like nothing in our savings account, but if we did, we would understand that we would have to pay taxes, i.e. making us have to earn a greater rate of return in the savings account just to compete with the life insurance internal rate of return. When you add a, a fee, 1% might be aggressive for some, 1% might be in, an amazing for others. It's just a point that I'm trying to illustrate, if you had to add a fee on top of, you know, the opportunity cost of where you store your capital, now you need to earn 6%. And if we take a $5 million death benefit for this person that we did, they would have to earn, pay $4,830 to get a permanent 30-year term insurance, making them um, needing to earn 6.9% in that alternative asset just to keep up with the boring old life insurance. Um, this is where people will say, well, I, the S&P or my business or real estate earns more than 6.9%. I'm saying this, we're comparing this to a savings account because in life insurance, you can borrow against a policy and invest in other things. And now you get a dollar doing multiple things. I'm not saying that life insurance gets a 6.9%. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if we compare it to other assets and you compare taxes, you compare fees, you compare buy term and invest difference, and you also understand that this is not an investment, you can utilize that capital while it continues to grow, you need to earn four, five, six percent or more in those safe assets just to hold the candle to the long term efficiency of storing your capital in the life insurance. That's all I'm saying. By the way, this is used I'm using whole life insurance, which a lot of times gets a bad rap because it's not great growth. And for me, where where I am just really convicted about is I do not sell life insurance as an investment. I prefer whole life over um, index universal life policies because I index universal life when set up and used properly and if all the stars align over 30 years could be amazing, but there's so many things that could change and I'm not buying life insurance as an investment. I'm buying it as a foundational place to store and use capital that will protect me and my family and my estate. And so I just, I would rather have a, a safer foundational asset versus something that should work but there's a lot of things that could change and as a result could take a safe asset and make it less safe. So I'll let you be the judge. Life insurance, bad rates of return. I'm never going to compare it to an investment. If someone does, would not recommend it. But if you understand that life insurance is a, is a safe, liquid asset that you have control now and in the future, I think it, it's a 400 plus difference. And that's why I put a lot of my savings into life insurance as the foundational asset for what we're doing. If you enjoy this video, please share it with others. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And we're trying to get people to think differently at Better Wealth. And so any support uh, means the world. We have uh, an and asset vault. So if this is interesting to you, if this concept's interesting and you want to learn more, we have a 50-page handbook. I have a master class that so we break this concept down more. You can talk to a coach that's an expert at the and asset and can help you decide does an and asset part of your, of your portfolio help you or not help you. Um, and we want to just be a resource for you. And so thank you for subscribing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you on the next video.